Well, it's uh, just after one o'clock, um, and this is our uh, January situation and outlook. Normally, uh, Dave Ripplinger is kind of emceeing this uh, for us for the most part and has been for a few years we've been doing it, but he's on the road out uh, spreading knowledge to uh, the state. Um, we have our usual panel of uh, presenters, including myself, as well as Tim and, and Frayne. However, Frayne is going to be doing his via uh, recording as he was, he's busy out, you know, he gets pretty busy this time of year on the road. So uh, his will be a, a recording that he prepared for the, for the outlook today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm just gonna talk uh, uh, briefly about uh, the fertilizer update and outlook um, heading into this spring. Uh, something I've been talking about and tracking now for several months and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of folks wanting to know what's going on with that. So this isn't gonna be in great detail, but just uh, sort of some of the information we have uh, as it stands right now. So uh, a report came out not long ago um, from the World Bank on some of the global things that are going on with fertilizer production and supplies. And essentially one, one of the things uh, in the background is natural gas prices and energy prices. And, and Dave Ripplinger has talked about this many times. They were really high in Europe and have been high for, for quite a while. And uh, somewhat recently started to come down some. But as of October of 2022, 70% of the ammonia production capacity was halted due to, due to these high prices in, uh, in Europe. And again, prices have eased some recently, which some think uh, is going to bring some of that, that production capacity back online. And, and the reason I bring up ammonia so much is because, uh, and talk about it in nitrogen fertilizer, it's sort of, sort of the precursor to all the nitrogen fertilizers we use. It's the, the building block for whatever uh, is being produced as far as that goes. And so, as I've told folks in the past, uh, fertilizer is a globally traded commodity now. And a lot of the price that used to be um, hinged solely on natural gas prices, it does still have a lot to do with it. And rising natural gas prices, certainly as high as they've been, uh, puts upward pressure on fertilizer. But so does global market conditions, concerns over exports, um, concerns over the conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine. And then as well as what's China doing with the uh, halting exports and, and shutting down some of the phosphorus production and, and other things that they've done. And so uh, though the conflict with, in Russia uh, they, they had a, there was a carve out in the sanctions that were put on them that allowed fertilizer exports to continue. But Belarus has still reduced potash exports by 50% or had before. So just to put into perspective how big of a player Russia and Belarus are in fertilizer, uh, in Ukraine for that matter, in fertilizer exports in, in the world. Uh, if you look at urea, Russia makes just over, uh, exports just over 15% of the world's urea. And uh, as far as ammonia goes, over 30% of the world's uh, ammonia exports uh, actually comes from Russia, uh, as well as sulfur, which goes into a lot of other products as well. And then they produce uh, about 8% or export uh, roughly 8% of the world's DAP. And then Ukraine uh, also exports, uh, you know, around 5 4 to 5% of the world's urea. And then you have uh, Belarus, who, who puts out a lot of the uh, uh, MOP as well. So... The conflict that occurred in this region or is, and is still ongoing obviously had a big impact on folks' concerns on what was going on with fertilizer and uh, uh, how, how that was going to impact supplies and the ability to secure it. Then we look at China. And as I said, on the, on the world stage, China uh, uh, is a big exporter of DAP. They export 30% of the world's diammonium phosphate. And that fell by 50%. And then urea exports declined by 60% uh, last year. So the blue line is 2019 to 2021 from January through December's uh, cumulative million metric tons exported um, of, of fertilizer of these products. And then the red line is 2022. And you can see significantly less. And one of the things that they did was they, uh, they had a, uh, basically a, a ban, so to speak, on exporting phosphorus out of China that was, they talked about last summer, it kind of ending last summer. Well, they extended it all the way through to December to ensure that they had the supplies that they needed and, and obviously having a major impact on global supplies. 
And then so when we talk about prices in the U.S., and that's what I'm going to talk about here here in just a second, um, we do produce pretty much all the ammonia that we need and nearly all the phosphorus that we need in the United States. We import all the potash that we need, pretty much all of it. The good, uh, the good news is, though, we get 75 percent of that from Canada. So our supply of fertilizers is pretty safe, uh, as safe as it is. As, just about anyone in the world. It's just that we're subject still to world prices. And a lot of the, these other countries, Brazil, for instance, Argentina, large agricultural countries are not independent in terms of fertilizer acquisition, India as well. And so the, the global price winds up going up and then our fertilizer distributors, because it's a globally traded commodity, our farmers here in North Dakota and the rest of the US for that matter are subject to world prices. The good news is, though, we've seen some relief on uh, fertilizer prices. The, the graph on the left shows the different nitrogen products in cost per pound to N, urea being the red one, which we use most of here in North Dakota, and hydrous is green, uh, UAN's 28 and 32 are orange and uh, blue. And that has come off, like urea to start last year was around $1.10 per pound of N. So uh, it's come down below 90 cents. So off uh, lower by by nearly 25 percent, 23 percent or so lower on the urea market, but still, and I'm going to show it in a minute. Way above the five-year average potash. I mean, it it was 375 dollars a ton. That's the five-year average for April, and uh, this year uh, or or 2022, it was clear up to almost 900 dollars a ton. It's come down some. But still $800 a ton right now, which is a cent more than double the five-year average. Um, so down some, but again, holding that holding that price pretty high. And if we look at urea and starter fertilizer, urea peaked last April at, at, at over $1,000 a ton. It's come down to about $750 a ton. And then starter fertilizer came down pretty sharply last fall. And went from a high of about $900 a ton last spring, starters about, again, around $750 a ton uh, also. But you look at those gray dotted lines near the bottom of the graph, that's the five-year average. And so typically this time of year, if you go back and, and, and you see how the gray, gray line ticked up, that was because the prices were so high last year. But you go back uh, February, uh, typically we're looking at urea, a little bit below 400 bucks, uh, still almost double that. And then same thing for uh, starter fertilizer. And then our phosphorus products, DAP and MAP, um, about $975 a ton or so for, for 875 for MAP and about 900, uh, 925 for DAP. And so they've come off their highs too. Those were both well over $1,000 a ton last spring, uh, coming down in that 20%, 25% range. But again, still double what, what we would typically see on that five-year average. So some relief compared to a year ago, but those who were thinking that fertilizer prices were going to come crashing down last summer and into the fall, that didn't really happen. Now, a 20% or so decline is not insignificant. Uh, I know as producers, we would like to see it a lot lower than that, but you can imagine this is kind of what some of the co-ops were concerned about. If you go out, if they had bought, let's say, urea at $1,100 a ton and it comes off 20% in a few months, uh, when we're talking about numbers that big, let's say it's $1,000 a ton, they, they could lose up to $200 a ton on that, going from 1,000 to 800 bucks. And if you got several unit trains purchase of, of urea, and you're sitting on it. Now I, I bought it for a thousand, and now I got to sell it for eight hundred and fifty. I mean, that was enough to, uh, to to break some of the, especially the smaller ones. And that's that's some of the issues that that they were concerned about. But so far, uh, not not it's been a pretty slow, gradual decline. So no bottom falling out or anything like that. And typically, this is when we see December or so, the least expensive fertilizer of the year. And it tends to ramp back up in cost uh, as we as we approach spring planting. So I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these prices go up in the coming in the coming months 
uh, as as planting ramps up because a lot of the issues that existed last year, uh, they're kind of, they're some a lot of them are still there. Um, again, restricted exports from China, a conflict in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia hasn't really resolved, and commodity prices are still strong. And so you have those factors going in, and there's just no not not a lot of resolution to any one of those three things that are supporting them staying as high as they are. So I just wanted to show, uh, so those numbers I showed on those charts come from, those are national averages. We don't have data for North Dakota yet. Not enough purchases have, have, have occurred to actually have DTN give you an average. But I just wanted to show some of the somewhat neighboring states at least who made some purchases. Uh, so the national average anhydrous price was uh, $1,300 a ton. Uh, without South Dakota, not enough purchases for data, but Minnesota almost $1,400 is what it was selling for, and Nebraska $1,315 uh, $1, per ton. Uh, then we go, go to Urea, uh, South Dakota almost $700 a ton, Minnesota closer to 850 dollars and Nebraska $750, and then uh, or MAP products and DAP, 910, almost $900 a ton for either one, potash, $775 uh, a ton as well. So those are those are more state by state. Uh, and, and, and we get more data as the spring ticks goes along and we get more, more actual purchases. So these are actual purchase numbers, not, not projections or anything like that. They go back and they look at the week before, whatever the average, they talk to several distributors, co-ops or whatever, and then, prices. So one of the things uh, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a faculty member, Dr. Dave Franzen, he puts out a lot of information on fertilization rates and how they compare or, or how they, the relationship that and commodity prices as far as fertilizing at what rate uh, and, and, and many other recommendations. Um, if you don't want to try to remember this long website link that I pasted here, uh, you can just kind of Google NDSU extension fertilizer and it'll pull up the page with all the information that, uh, that those folks, uh, soil scientists uh, put out on, on fertilizer. And the other thing I'll plug is our crop compare tool uh, that we, we use at NDSU. And, and that's something that you can use to kind of put in your own costs what, or what you think you're gonna have to pay for these products per acre. Then look at your projected yield and what you expect to get in a commodity price and try to see, you know, maybe if planting one crop versus another, for instance, beans versus corn or wheat versus corn, wheat versus beans, et cetera, to see which one may have, based on what you think commodity prices are going to be and your production costs are as well as yields, which one is, is possibly going to uh, pay out uh, the most for you or uh, have the biggest, best net uh, of any of those. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Shrain Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to join you live today. I'm traveling, um, so this is recorded. But if you do have any questions or have anything later on, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to try and answer the any kind of questions you might have. Um, so again, here's my contact information. If you do think of something later on and you want to visit about it, I'd be happy to do that. So USDA uh, gave us a major data dump. Uh, we had four major reports that came out this morning. Uh, we had the monthly update for the WASD, which is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, looking at both domestic and global production and usage consumption. We had the annual crop production numbers, which is our final estimates for planted acreage, harvested acreage, and uh, total production, total bushels produced for the major commodities. We had the winter wheat seedings report, which is the first survey-based estimate of farmer seedings for winter wheat. And finally, we had the quarterly grain stocks report, uh, which is, again is a quarterly or every three month uh, survey of inventories, both on farm and off farm of the existing available supplies. So I'm gonna go through each one of those very quickly. So we'll start out with uh, the pr production numbers. Now this is would be for the United States. Uh, the wheat numbers we got earlier in the small grains report, but this would be give us the final numbers then for corn and soybeans. Um, the row on the very top in blue is the average trade estimate. So that's what the trade was expecting to see out of the crop report. Um, on the very towards the bottom, it highlighted in black 
is the numbers we got in November. So that was the last official numbers coming out of USDA. And of course, the numbers on the very bottom in red are the numbers we got today. So what I do want to do is kind of compare the numbers we received today versus what the market was expecting to see. Okay, so let's go through these very quickly. For corn, um, we got about 13.73 billion bushels of production, which is actually lower than what the trade was expecting. They were seeing, they were expecting numbers very similar to what we saw in the November report. Now that reduction in total bushels produced is a combination of a slight increase in the yield, if you notice this uh, 173.3 versus what the trade was expecting at 172.5, but also a reduction in harvested acres. So there wasn't quite as many acres harvested for grain production. And we don't know exactly where those acres disappeared to. My suspicion is we had a little bit more corn harvested for silage than was first expected. So some of those, especially in some of those drought areas, in the Western Corn Belt. And my guess is that some of those, those acres that were originally intended to be harvested um, for grain uh, turned out to be harvested for corn silage instead, thus the reduction in harvested area. On the production side for soybeans, we're looking at about 4.2776 excuse me, uh, billion bushels, a slight reduction from what the trade was expecting and the numbers we got last month. Most of that was actually a reduction in yield. So the largest portion was a reduction in yield for the national average yield estimates. We also had a slight reduction in the area harvested. But again, most of that was in the yield numbers. So, so um, again, we're doing the official counting now or cross-checking with not only the survey-based information from uh, from farmers through NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service, but also cross-checking those numbers, at least cross-validating those numbers with the RMA data from crop insurance, as well as the data we get from FSA, which is the Farm Service Agency for Farm Program Analysis. All right, next would be the ending stock. So how much did our expectation for inventories, the amount we're going to have in, at 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 in the bin just before harvest of next year. How did that change? Um, small reduction or in, in the available supplies for wheat. Uh, there was a slight increase in the amount of wheat going into the feed uh, channels. Um, thus a, the adjustment, so a slight reduction from what we saw last month. Um, the trade was expecting a slight increase. On the corn side, uh, most of that reduction from what we saw, uh, what the trade was expecting to see, but also from last month, it was a combination of obviously a reduction in total production, but we, we also had an adjustment or reduction in the consumption port with, portion with about 150 million bushel decrease in exports. And that's been something I've talked about before that so far our corn export pace has been relatively slow compared to last year and the previous years at this time of year. So the fact that we saw a slight reduction in corn exports was not um, unexpected. Uh, the unexpected por portion was actually the reduction in the production areas. On the soybean side, when you look at the numbers we got last month versus the numbers we got this month, as well as the numbers that the trade was expecting, trade was expecting a slight increase in ending stocks. We actually got a slight decrease in ending stocks, primarily because, again, of the reduction in the production numbers. There was a reduction in um, in the uh, crushed, oh, excuse me, the export demand for soybeans um, the, to compensate for again some of the tighter supplies. Um, and, and I guess, given what we see right now today, I think a lot of that is not our current export pace, but actually what they anticipate the Brazilian harvest being a little bit earlier than normal. And therefore, some of our the window for our exp export season is going to be a little bit tighter and shorter than we would normally see. So thus expecting adjusting our expectations for total soybean exports this year. Looking at South American production, there were some adjustments made. Um, several of those were anticipated. So let's go through Argentina first. Argentine corn, um, last month they had 55 million metric ton production. This would be total corn production out of, out of Argentina. Dropped down to about uh, 52 million metric ton, which is very close to what the trade was expecting. Soybeans, again, a pretty significant reduction in 
uh, in expected soybean yields and soybean production out of Argentina. Obviously, they've had some very, very dry conditions. They're coming into their third year of continuous drought. And so total soybean production was expected to be down. Again, very similar to what the trade was expecting, but a little bit more than, than I think I was in. Anticipating. I, we are expecting some of these reductions to occur, but there's coming a little faster than anticipated. On the Brazilian corn, um, a slight reduction in corn. Uh, and I do think some of that is because of the first crop corn and some of the drier conditions showing up in southern Brazil. But again, very small changes. It's a little bit early to try and put a solid number on Brazilian corn as well as Brazilian soybeans. Now, notice that there was a slight increase in, in Brazilian soybean production estimates. USDA has been kind of flip-flopping back and forth between 152 and 153 for the last several months. So I guess this is not not a major adjustment. Um, it is some fine-tuning. We'll have to wait to see. Obviously, their weather conditions over the next month or so are going to have, have big, big implications for the size of the soybean crop. Moving on to quarterly grain stocks. So this would be, again, a survey of how many bushels do we currently have in inventory, both commercial as well as on farm. Um, these numbers came out a little bit tighter than we had first expected. On the, on the wheat side, um, there was a slight reduction. Last, last year at this time, we had about 1.3 billion bushels. The U.S., um, the average trade estimate was about the same. We came in just a little bit under that number. Thus, I do think that was the reason USDA tweaked or adjusted the feed consumption on wheat, just because that's very difficult to track and follow. The inventories for corn. Uh, the trade was expecting about 11.1 1, uh, billion bushels. We got about 10.8 billion. And again, I do think that's a reflection of the lower yields uh, that we and the lower harvested acreage for corn. On the soybean side, uh, again, some small reductions. They were expecting some numbers very similar to what we saw this time last year. We're a little bit behind that. I do think that's because of a little bit more rapid export pace for soybeans. Now, not total exports, but just the pace of exports. We Some of our exports were kind of front loaded this year. And then finally, coming to the winter wheat seedings report, I guess of all the numbers that we came out with today, uh, I think probably the, the two Numbers that will, are the two areas that will get the most attention, of course, will be soybean, will be corn production numbers, total corn production, but also I think this winter wheat seedings number. So if we look at what actually came out, about 36 point, of almost 37 uh, million acres of winter wheat uh, planted this last year versus what the trade was expecting at about 34 and a half. And, and up pretty significantly from last year at about 33 million acres. Uh, this, this is kind of a surprise, surprise, not that it went up, but just to the degree that it increased. Most of that came in the form of hard red winter wheat. So it, the trade was expecting about 23.8, we got 25.3. So again, a little bit higher winter wheat, hard red winter wheat seedings than we had expected. Also a slight increase in the soft red winter wheat. So the hard red winter wheat would be the Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado wheat. The soft red winter wheat is primarily in Southern Illinois, Missouri, um, parts of Kentucky, et cetera. So a slight increase there. Um, and then also a slight increase in white winter wheat, which is primarily in the Pacific Northwest, but we do have some of that also grown in Michigan and Wisconsin. So. As we add all those up, a little bit higher or greater increase in winter wheat seedings than we had expected uh, has a slight impact on the wheat market, um, obviously for, heart, for the winter wheats in particular, uh, but also potentially having some, some interesting ramifications as we begin into spring planting for corn and soybeans and cotton, kind of that division of where are we going to get all of our acres and what acreage is going to be planted for 2023. Just final comment before I, I uh, finish up here, just as a reminder for the hard red winter wheat folks, um, the soft red winter wheat area, which is kind of in this in this part of the U.S., uh, the uh, Illinois, uh, Missouri, Kentucky area, some of Indiana, you know, that that is a little bit on the dry side right now. Most of the attention that we're gaining in the winter wheat area, of course, is because of the hard red winter wheat in western Kansas. Um, and that is something winter wheat conditions in both Kansas and Oklahoma are below uh, what we normally see this time of year. Uh, but again, the weather conditions that occurred during spring 
as the winter wheat is starting to break dormancy is going to have a huge, huge impact on their ability and the potential yield. So I don't want to put too much weight on these dry conditions right now. Uh, we will have to wait to see as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I want to thank you for your time and attention. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me if you if in, in the near future. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, NDSU Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. What I'm going to do today is just kind of preview the uh, cattle inventory, USDA cattle inventory report that comes out at the end of the month, and then just look at what the current cattle prices are, are uh, doing. And so uh, the uh, USDA every January does a survey of all cattle producers by state. And so uh, our new report is going to be out on January 31st at two o'clock. If you're interested in that, in our next webinar, I will go through the uh, all the details of that. So if you uh, want to get the report, though, you can look at it on January 31st. So on the screen, uh, it just shows what the report for the U.S. beef cow numbers are for the last 20 years. And I'm just going to concentrate on the the. Uh, right hand side of the chart there what's happened the last several years and so uh, on a cyclical basis we topped out in 2019 at 31.7 million head went down uh three years so on january 1st 2022 we were just over 30 million and uh, if you've been hearing me before on these webinars we had a huge uh one of the largest cow slaughters ever and uh and we have one of the lowest numbers of replacement heifers on record and they went into the feedlot and so because of that uh, we are expecting to, to be down of the fourth year and the question is not whether we went down because we did it's how much did we go down uh, and the numbers of course on uh, come out on january 31st it says of january 1st of the year are going to show that now and also on the right hand side there you see cattle facts is uh, estimating that's the arm of national the information arm of the national cattlemen's beef association their estimate just came out uh, they're estimating 29.1 million head which would be down uh, three percent or so and the lmic livestock marketing information center that uh, i am part of here it's a uh, many extension services in the western u.s make up that uh we came out at 28.8 so uh regardless you see the previous low was in 2014 at 29 million head and so our expectations are to be very close to that cattle facts just a hair above and lmic a hair below so we'll be back very close to 2014 levels and then remember uh 2014 was our previous record high uh for cattle prices so from a numbers uh standpoint that isn't looking at beef demand and other things but from a sheer number standpoint we're going to be back to where we were with those record high levels so let's look at just to go through the different market classes here in North Dakota and we'll start off with fed cattle there and um, my chart uh, key there in terms of the colors will be the same for all the charts so I'll spend a little bit more time explaining it here and I just started now with the 2023 so the colors are uh, the, the year colors are a little bit off so on the bottom usually I put three years on a chart but I'm leaving uh, uh, 2020 on the chart that green line on the bottom because that's the COVID year just to see how abnormal we were there in 2020 so that's the green line the uh, purple line then is 2021 the blue line is 2022 and then the red line as we progress across the year will be the 2023 numbers and then if there is a futures market the red squares then will correspond with the red line that would stay so, futures and so uh uh, and then if there is a 2024 futures market, those are the gold squares at the top. So, uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on the last couple of years. Go back to, to last year. Uh, we started off about 140 and ended up there right where we are now, about 160. And uh, and there's the uh, well, start I off may have to be sharing to do it. Th this year at 
at 150. We're just last week right at 158. And uh, so uh, our all-time record high then, like I mentioned record highs before, was back in 2014. The record, and this is on a live basis, which would correspond to the red line or the blue line last year. The record high in 2014 was 153.84. Certainly looks like we're going to break that. Uh, if you uh, just average those six futures contracts of yesterday's close, I just did that before we came on, and and the average is, is over 160, as you see across from that 160 line, so that would be a record. The WASDE report uh, came out today that Frame was going to talk about for grains. The USD has been at an average estimate for 20 uh, 20 for this year, 2023 at 155.50, but they raised it today to uh, 158.25. And so all indications are now that we will have record high cattle prices next year. And certainly the low supply is a part of that. We had record high beef production this year. And uh, and again, in the WASDA report that just came out today, USDA is backing uh, that off uh, considerably. Our beef production for next year and our cattle and feed numbers are going down. And a week from Friday, we'll have another cattle and feed report showing likely uh, less cattle and feed. So uh, all that then is pointing the way to higher prices. And of course, those gold bars as we go into 2024, you know, we just add another $10 on them likely and so cyclically I last time I talked more about uh, what our expectations are and cyclical higher prices and so on but but uh, looks like uh, record high prices for fed cattle next year uh, barring some um, uh, catastrophe there and uh, then you know beef production likely in 2024 is going to be down again and it just depends on when it rains the reason why our cow herd has went down for for four years is because of the intense drought that we've had in the U.S., but in the western U.S., and that is improving somewhat. We were up this summer at 75 percent of the beef cow herd in drought, and now the, the today's uh, drought monitor that comes out shows that we're closer to 60 percent of the beef cow herd in drought, so it is going down a little with the rain they've had in the southwest, but still a lot of cattle in, in drought, and so, uh, you know, when that drought breaks, and we keep the heifer calves back and, and quit slaughtering cows, that's when we're going to see a big, big spike in prices quite likely. So I'll move on to the calf prices then. Again, the same uh, color code there. No uh, futures for calf prices, but, um, you know, the COVID year, uh, a bad year down there with the green line, some improvement in 2021. And then last year, throughout the year, we did about $30 better on calf prices, uh, the blue line there towards the top with the better, uh, with, with the lower numbers that we've had. And, you know, even in spite of the drought, the uh, record high for 2014 for calves was $250. And so we're uh, quite a ways from that and probably won't get a record next year. It is possible, but, but not probable. And, you know, we're starting off there at just uh, you know, about 208, and we, we expect them to do better uh, by $20 or so, and we'll be off the top of the chart, I think, by uh, April of, above 220 there. And, uh, and uh, you know, the last week's average price there was like a, right about a little over between 207 and 208 at North Dakota auction markets. Yesterday it kissed. They were about ten dollars higher at two seventeen, and so we'll see how we end up for the week. So uh, again, expect better uh, calf prices throughout the year, uh, but not to record levels. Maybe by twenty twenty four, depends on the rain and so on, and or certainly by twenty twenty five, we we could be up there. And the reason why is because corn is much higher now than it was back in 2014, our previous record on cattle, $4 average in 14 and $7 uh, average last year. And we, you know, uh, uh, Frayne would have talked about, uh, you know, USDA lowered the production for this year by by uh, some, and that's what sparked the futures market for corn a little bit today. But we don't know what corn prices are going to be next year, and that'll weigh into it too, but, but still, uh, no matter what, 
because of our lower supplies, we're going to have higher prices and, you know, $20 higher or so on calves, quite likely. So I'll go to the heavyweight yearling cattle then, the, more the 800 pounders, kind of the same story there is $20 higher last year. And, uh, and uh, starting off there at 180 this year. Uh, the, the first week this year, and uh, again, they're up on the mar market so far about $5 higher this week, see how they end up. But uh, anyway, the red bars then for uh, this year are indicating kind of gradually increasing prices throughout the year, getting them up to uh, average about uh, right about 210 there at the end of the year. Our 2014 record high was 2008. So again, we're probably not going to quite hit that uh, record high this year because we're starting off at lower, but we'll be up to those levels by the end of the year and then bring those over to start out 2024. Uh, certainly could be a record year again. A lot of things go into that and is it going to rain and, and corn prices and, and so on but uh, looks like gradual improvement there throughout the year. So uh, kind of end up with cow prices and, uh, you know, very seasonal pattern there. They usually go up into the summer, but then they really crash there in the fall when all the cows are PG checked and come to market. But we had again, $20 uh, higher cow prices throughout the year in spite of slaughter being up 12% over the previous year when it was up 5% then too because of the drought. So we killed uh, uh, as many cows as, as we have for quite a number of years and yet we had uh, pretty good prices there. Uh, and uh, again, a little bit on these prices. These are these are average 85 to 90 percent lean cows. So these would be broken mouth cows that had a calf on them all year, and uh, you know, and, and are being sold. So they would be at the low end of the market. At the upper right hand corner shows a market report for cows from a market in North Dakota from last week. And you know, producers tell me I got 75 or more or whatever, 68 or for for my cows, and you're down there. At, at 63 but this would be the low end of the market and you can just bring that that trend up for all those but anyway uh looks like probably if things go uh, like they usually do by midsummer we could be up to 90 dollars on them we expect them to do better throughout the year you know if it rains and cow slaughter drops off significantly then they're really going to spark to the record high in 2014 was a hundred dollars for the year that was the annual average and so we'll see again in uh, um, if not, probably won't hit that this year because we're starting off at 63, but by uh, uh, next year, the year after that, probably uh, uh, if it rains and we start rebuilding the herd and beef cow slaughter goes down, so on, we will hit that. Mm -hmm.